So if someone were to ask you to identify the one area where Christians today have departed furthest from biblical teaching and practice, what would your answer be? Let me repeat the question. Someone were to ask you to identify the one area where Christians today have departed furthest from biblical faith and practice, what would your answer be? Now, I've had a lot more time to think about that question because I came up with that question. (laughs) And as I've thought about it, I think that my answer would come in the form of a great six-syllable word that I probably first came across in seminary, a word um, that's based on a Greek root, it's ecclesiology. And what ecclesiology is, it's the doctrine of the church. I think if Christians uh, have um, suffer from, from an error, an error in, the, in the modern church today, uh, it has to do with the doctrine of the church. The New Testament holds an incredibly high view of the church. Uh, It is called, the church is called the body of Christ. The church is called the bride of Christ. The New Testament pictures the church, and by the church it's not talking about a building or organized religion or an institution, it's talking about followers of Jesus Christ uh, who are uh, worshiping and serving and growing together. The New Testament pictures the church as God's plan A for reaching the lost, for making disciples, and for sending them out. And it's interesting that in the New Testament there is no plan B. That's it. The church. The church is responsible for the proclamation of the gospel, uh, for showing other people what the gospel is. Uh, looks like in the life of a community of faith. The New Testament tells us that every member of the church of Jesus Christ matters. As a matter of fact, the the word member uh, is actually a concept that the Apostle Paul came up with. And he uses in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to describe how each of us as followers of Jesus Christ is meant to belong to and to participate in and to contribute to the health and the ministry and mission of the local congregation of which we are all meant to be a part. Over, uh, after over 40 years of ministry, I've really come to believe that there are there's really quite a large group of people out there who view themselves as Christians, but who are either unaware of or have just chosen to ignore what the Bible has to say about the irreplaceable role, the irreplaceable part that the church has to play in the plan of God. And they are either unaware of or have chosen to ignore the importance of our personal participation in the life of the church, viewing membership and participation, even corporate worship as optional or discretionary, something you do uh, if you're not otherwise busy. In addition to, to being totally at odds with what Scripture teaches, That attitude that the church is optional or discretionary, that attitude, that understanding has a host of unintended consequences. It has unintended consequences for the person who holds that view because they're living in kind of a false reality in which they believe that they are being faithful to Christ when in fact they're ignoring or unaware of one of the most important responsibilities and opportunities that we have as Jesus followers. It has unintended consequences for the churches of which they are ostensibly a part. Because I'll tell you something, when people aren't here to support one another, it's discouraging. It's discouraging to other believers. 
It, and I've never said this during my time here with you. It's discouraging to your pastors. And in my judgment, maybe most important of all, it has unintended consequences for the eternal salvation of those whom the church has been called out of the world by God to reach with the good news of the gospel. How we think of church and, and the behavior that grows out of what we think about, how we think about the church, has enormous implications and consequences for us, for the churches of which we are a part, and for people who don't yet know Christ. Now this week, as I mentioned earlier, we're continuing our series on the texts that have touched us, in which we're looking at uh, passages of Scripture chosen by members of our congregation because they've spoken to them in a special way that has had a lifelong impact on them. And today we're looking at a passage that was chosen by one of our Stonebridge elders, Steve Kep. Let's take a look at what Steve's text is today. Hi, my name is Steve Kep, and my Bible verse is from Titus 2, verse 1 through 2. It says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate in sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Just two, two verses there, but, but Steve's uh, text, those two verses are taken from a, a larger passage, of course, chapter uh, in Titus, Titus chapter 2, in which the Apostle Paul is talking not just to older guys in the church, he's going to be speaking to older women, he's going to be speaking to young men and young women, and even he's going to be addressing uh, slaves or servants who were a large part of the early church because they were a large part of the population of the Roman Empire. Paul is really eager to show how each of those groups and constituencies has a really vital and critical part to play in the health, in the ministry, and in the mission of the church of Jesus Christ. But before we, we, we get into that, just a little bit of background, as I like to contextualize the text in terms of uh, the biblical context and historical context. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Titus, first of all. Titus was from a Greek background rather than from a Jewish background. This was incredibly important because um, his becoming a Christian actually uh, became kind of a flashpoint in the early church. There was a, a, a debate that emerged uh, very early on in the development of the church because th the question was this. Uh, Jesus was Jewish. His original disciples were Jewish. In order to become a Christian, does that mean people who aren't Jewish need to become Jewish first? And by the way, that becoming Jewish first has a, a number of implications. For instance, in the case of Titus, does Titus have to be circumcised, which is the mark of, of Judaism for uh, for people who came to, to Judaism, either from a Jewish background or from a Gentile background, or to become Jewish, they needed, men needed to be circumcised. Was it, it, when Titus became a believer, did he have to be circumcised? And that question led to this uh, great uh, council that took place in Jerusalem. It's recorded in Acts chapter 15, where all of the leaders of the church come together and say, okay, we know this is true for Jewish um, the people from a Jewish background, what about guys like Titus? And, and ultimately the decision was made, no, he doesn't have to become Jewish in order to become Christian. Titus was, was one of Paul's first converts. And um, their relationship was so long lived that in fact, uh, Titus, who was one of, the first con his, of his first uh, converts, became one of Paul's most trusted colleagues. Titus accompanied the Apostle Paul and, and sometimes uh, his colleague Barnabas to Jerusalem, to Corinth, to Macedonia, and, uh, and to Crete, and, and elsewhere. So they traveled around what would nowadays be um, modern-day Greece. 
when problems emerged in the Corinthian and, and the Cretan churches. Um, and Paul couldn't be there himself because he was otherwise involved in, in, in other things. Paul sent Titus to help manage and help to address the problems there. And that's really important because it speaks highly of Paul's trust in Titus. And it speaks highly of Titus's solid grounding in the gospel. The, the very last we hear of, of Titus in Scripture, uh, he is in Dalmatia. Uh, some of you may wonder, where, well, where's Dalmatia? That's modern-day Croatia. So if you've ever been in a Mediterranean cruise and gone to Split or Dubrovnik, that, that's Dalmatia. Paul wrote his letter to Titus about 65 A.D. And uh, at that period of time, Titus was in Crete, where Paul had sent him and appointed him to deal with the big problems that the church there was facing, particularly number of false teachers who were undermining the gospel and undermining the health of the church. Tradition tells us that uh, Titus eventually actually became the bishop of Crete and oversaw all of the churches there. Uh, this hasn't happened quite yet uh, in, um, when Paul's written this, this particular letter. Now, that's Titus. What about Crete? Crete is an island in the Mediterranean. One of the things that was fascinating about Crete is that it claimed to be the birthplace of Zeus, Zeus being the chief god in Greek mythology. Uh, the, the people who lived in Crete actually had an unfortunate, but who knows, it could have been well-deserved, uh, reputation among other people. Uh, they, most people didn't trust them. They thought that they were liars, and uh, they pointed to the fact that they claimed, the people who lived on, on Crete claimed that the body of Zeus was buried on Crete, which obviously couldn't be the case because Zeus is a made-up guy. He's just a, a figure in mythology. Um, its most important city was a place called Gnosis, and you can see it. It's, um, this, uh, these are actually architectural ruins of uh, ancient Gnosis that are still visible today, and you can visit them if you were to go to Crete. Now, in, in Paul's letter here to Titus, Paul addresses, as I said, this pressing problem of these false teachers who live uh, in Crete and who are undermining the gospel. He, uh, he offers Titus guidance on the kind of people who should serve in church leadership. Instead of these false teachers, he says, this, these are the kind of people that you want to look for uh, in, in, as leaders of your church. And he writes about this in Titus chapter 1. And I will say just in, in terms of a touch point for our congregation here, Every year, our church nominating committee carefully goes over Titus chapter 1, some other passages in Scripture, before they begin their important work of choosing potential elders and deacons to present to the congregation. Because it's in Titus, and First and Second Timothy and elsewhere, that Paul really lays out some of the qualifications. This is just a kind of a typical passage here. Um, uh, an elder must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. You can see here that, um, that there are not only theological qualifications, which are addressed elsewhere, but there are kind of attitudes and uh, ways of, of uh, interacting with people, behaviors, uh, habits that are addressed. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, that is, open to people. One who loves what is good, rather than focusing, being negative and focusing uh, just on what, what's evil. One who loves good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, after Paul talks about the kind of leadership that's appropriate to, to kind of uh, oversee a local congregation, Paul then turns his attention to what Titus needs to be teaching, what he needs to emphasize in his teaching. 
to the different groups and constituencies that are part of the congregation in Crete. And he kind of goes through them one by one. And one of Paul's overarching themes in Titus is that Christians of all ages, all stages, and all stations of life, Christians need to be Christ-like. Oh, this seems obvious, but the people in Crete didn't get it. They, they understood themselves to be believers, but they were not living Christ-like lives. And so Paul said, Titus, when you go back to Crete, you need to be addressing this. Uh, knowing that each age, each stage, each station is subject to its own besetting sins, its own besetting temptations, its own besetting distractions. Paul addresses each one of these constituencies in, in turn. He starts with the older men. And in a, in a certain sense, that makes sense that he should start with the older men because it was kind of hierarchical society. The older men sort of set the tone for the rest of the congregation. So what does he tell Titus to do? He tells Titus, teach the older men to be temperate. The word could also be translated sober. Teach the older men to be temperate, to be worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Sound in faith, doctrinally, you know, on point. In love, you know, you can be theologically correct, but if you're a jerk and you don't love people, you, you know, you're not setting a good example. And in endurance, that is people who don't start out great but then drift away, but people who persevere. Now, these, these older men may have been older in age, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were mature in their faith. There is not a direct connection here between age and spiritual maturity. These guys had lived most of their lives in the context of a pagan culture. I just want, want you to think about this for a second. Here's somebody, let's say they became a, a follower of Christ at, um, at age 60. Um, for, for six decades, they've been living in a, a pagan culture as pagan people and stuff, and then suddenly they are expected to be, uh, be different. Um, and, and this, it, where there aren't that many models of what different would look like, what does uh, being a Christian look like in the context of, of a pagan culture? So they need to be taught. And this is what Paul says, teach these older men. And you know, one, one important part about teaching is unlearning bad stuff that's become so much a part of our perspective and, and kind of the habitual way that we've done things. It's hard to unlearn things. That's why they need to be taught to live Christ-like lives. Christ-like lives that set them apart from other people. Now, what does that look like in Crete? Well, it's what Paul is saying, teach the older men this. It, it means exercising sound judgment, being sober, being temperate. This is what, one of the things that I think really grabbed Steve in this particular passage, the importance of, of being sober, sober thinking, um, living in a way that was worthy of other people. Shout out to Aretha Franklin, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Live in a way that's worthy of other people's respect. You don't uh, expect respect just because you're old or just because of some office you hold or some job that you do, but because of your character. It's a very different thing. Because of their manner of life. And then he says, and be self-controlled. Now, a lack of self-control seems to have been a huge issue in Crete. And we know that because Paul mentions it as one of the requirements for elders. You need to, to exercise self-control. You don't fly off at the handle. You're not flippant. Exercise self-control. But he doesn't just say that about elders. He says, teach the el older men, be self-controlled. He goes on to tell the women, the older women, be self-controlled. He says, you know, teaches the older women to teach the younger women be self-controlled. 
He has one piece of advice for the younger men. Guess what it is? Be self-controlled. The only group that he doesn't tell to be self-controlled are the servants and slaves because they've got to live that way. Paul tells Titus, likewise, he's dressed the older men, likewise, and, and by the way, uh, you older guys in the church here, you mature saints, this is God's word to us. We need to live our lives in a way that's worthy of respect, to have that kind of quality of character, because it reflects on Christ and on his church, and it models for younger people what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Paul tells Titus, likewise, teach the older women. Teach them what? To be reverent in the way they live. And then, you know, read between the lines. You can tell uh, ways in which they haven't really been that reverent. Not to be slanderers. That word that's translated slanderers is diabolos. It's used... Uh, over uh, 30 times in the New Testament to describe Satan. Uh, It's sometimes translated gossipers. The people who have critical spirit, don't don't have this negative, critical spirit, the fault-finding, judgmental attitude. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine. This seems to have been a problem. But, instead of those things, to teach what is good. Uh, it, it's interesting, it, it's pretty clear that um, older women in first century Crete, uh, and, and just think about the life cycle of, of people in general, older women in first century Crete would have children who were grown and out of the house. And what that meant was that they would have more discretionary time which they could use in either godly ways or ungodly ways. Some, it seemed, um, were making poor choices because they had developed over time, and who knows, maybe because of their life experiences. That's all you know, just kind of guesswork, but it seems for whatever reason that they have developed a disapproving and critical spirit. And you can just imagine, you know, these small groups of women who would get together and just sort of criticize, you know, the, their husbands or uh, younger women or uh, their neighbors. Other, others of them were tempted to get caught up. It says not to be addicted to much, much wine. Um, they were drinking a lot. They had time on their hands, disposable income. They were drinking. But, I, you know, I would characterize that rather than uh, just addicted to much wine. I think their really besetting sin, sin here was recreational escapism. And I want to call it recreational escapism because there are lots of ways in which we can escape reality recreationally. And it's not just alcohol or drugs. Um, there are all kinds of ways. Paul tells Titus to teach these older women not to be slanderers, gossips, negative, judgmental, critical spirits, not to be addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Use that time that you have now to make a positive difference in people's lives. He says, then, he writes to Timothy, then they can urge the younger women to do what? To love their husbands and children to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husband so that no one will malign the word of God. And we're going to put a pin in, in part of that and, and come back to it in, in a moment. But um, Paul's, Paul's telling them, look, the way you're living your life, is, if you older women, what you're doing with your time is setting an example for the, the younger women. Do you want them to be negative and critical people? When you could help them to learn how to, to love their husbands and their kids and to, to be self-controlled, there's that word again, and pure and kind. Now, some of what Paul says here I think can be a little off-putting to, to modern readers, and particularly that line um, about subject to their husbands. 
And I, I think that's probably because we fail to understand the words in the context in which they were originally written or spoken. Um, think about this. Most young couples in the ancient world found themselves in arranged marriages. You know, nowadays, um, because of the culture in which we live, a, a culture that, uh, that, is, um, uh, that thinks about marriage in the context of romantic love, an idea, by the way, which grew out of the Middle Ages. It's not like a universally shared concept the world over. But young, young couples in, in ancient Crete and elsewhere in the ancient world and in a lot of places around the world today find themselves in arranged marriages. Love, whether it's romantic love or kind of uh, family love or sacrificial love. Love and kindness played almost no part in their union. You know, these were uh, family negotiations and arrangements and so on. The idea of a Christian home, the idea of a Christian marriage in which a husband and wife actually loved one another, a husband and wife actually uh, were kind to one another, a husband and wife mutually submitted to one another, it was totally new. It was unheard of. It was a completely new concept in Crete because Christianity was a new concept in Crete. Uh, the Apostle Paul, by the way, fleshes this I idea about love and kindness and, and sacrifice in Christian marriage. He fleshes that out more fully in Ephesians chapter 5 and, and Colossians 3. And, and this is basically his point. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what a Christian marriage is, is meant to be. The greatest, Paul's point is, the greatest priority in the home should be love. Love manifest in mutual submission of husband and wife. The husband uh, gives himself for his wife as Christ sacrificed himself for the church, Paul says in Ephesians 5. So this, this isn't about the subjugation of of women, which is, you know, something we read into the text from 21st century. But it's Paul introducing the idea of love and kindness and mutual submission into a completely pagan culture. Uh, the duty of younger men is summed up in a simple single sentence, just one sentence. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Now, does anybody else find that uh, interesting? I think it's really telling. Because for whatever reason, young guys seem to find themselves, and actually I think probably more often than not put themselves, in situations where they have lots of opportunities to make stupid mistakes. Can I hear an amen from somebody? Anybody here ever done stupid, you guys, anybody done stupid things when you were younger? When I was a, a chaplain at the University of Virginia Medical Center, my, my main area of responsibility was uh, in psychiatry and behavioral medicine, but I also spent a lot of time uh, in the intensive care units, me medical intensive care, surgical intensive care, um, as well as uh, the spinal cord unit. I did a couple uh, units there. It was interesting, the population of the spinal cord injury unit. Um, it was not older men. It was not older women. It was not younger women. Who was it? Young guys. Yeah, 20-something guys, pretty much, and, and some teens. And, and these were guys who, for whatever reason, thought it would be a really great idea to hop on their motorcycle without their helmets and go as fast as they can on mountain roads or jump off a cliff into a lake that, or a creek or whatever that they hadn't looked into before. And these guys... Um, it felt so bad of them. at the prime of their life, they find themselves facing a future in which they're going to spend the rest of their lives in a wheelchair. Um, 
not only do, do young guys uh, oftentimes, and, and by the way, uh, you know, neuroscientists have, have discovered that part of the reason for, for some of this may be the fact that the part of your brain that actually um, is responsible for looking at long-term consequences of things doesn't fully develop until you're age 26, which is why rental, auto rental companies will not rent to people who are 25 or younger. But, but in addition, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, when we're, guys, when we're younger, we do this. We put ourselves in situations that are, can be kind of dangerous and everything. Younger guys also have this kind of overconfidence that is born from inexperience. They don't know what they don't know, and they imagine themselves to be, um, you know, bulletproof. And that gets them into trouble. And so th this is why Paul tells Titus, he, he doesn't give them, uh, these younger guys a lot of advice. Uh, uh, you know, he just says, you guys need to learn to control your impulses. Not be stupid. He, he, tells, he teaches them, he tells Titus to teach them to be self-controlled. And then, then he's addressing Titus, he says, encourage them by setting an example for them, by doing good. This is great. Uh, Paul to Titus, in everything, set them an example by doing what's good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. You know, for people who are opposed uh, to the Christian faith, for whatever reason, and, and there are many, um, they're just looking for an opportunity to find fault with Christians and with Christian leaders. And because all of us are uh, in process, um, it's always going to be easy to do. But one of the things that Paul is saying here is, look, try to establish a church in which you minimize the possibility of anybody finding fault with what you say how you say it, the way you live your life. Live with integrity. Live with consistency with the gospel. Show integrity, seriousness. You know, as uh, Christian leaders, and here, you know, Paul's talking to, to Titus as a person who's responsible for the proclamation of the gospel and interpretation of the gospel um, uh, among uh, those responsible uh, to his care. He talks about integrity, seriousness, gra gravitas, you know, helping people understand. We're living our lives in light of eternity here. Soundness of speech that can't, can't be condemned. Now, the, I, the idea here is that, that we are to use our God-given wisdom and experience to guide and to encourage others. And that's not true of Titus and, and of other people who are responsible um, with proclaiming the gospel. It's true for all of us as believers. Every single one of us. Use your God-given wisdom and experience to guide and encourage others. When we become Christians, this is so important for us to know, when we become Christians, life is not all about us anymore. This is where that, that concept of ecclesiology comes in. You know, a lot of people think, oh, the reason I come to worship is to hear a message to help me with my life. It's all about me. It's not all about you. I would hope that the messages help you in your life. But that's not the only reason we worship, because life is not all about us anymore. We as Christians, if you are a mature Christian, you understand our words, our actions, our attitudes, everything about us has an enormous impact on other people. Other people including, but by no means limited to, our spouses. Guys, how we treat our, our spouses, our attitudes, our actions, it has an impact on our spouses, on our kids, on our larger extended family, on our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, has an impact on our church and, and indeed has an impact on those who don't yet know Christ. Um, 
a couple of weeks ago, you know, I sent out my letter to the congregation uh, talking about my uh, uh, decision that I'll be retiring at the end of this year. And I waited a week or so before I, you know, said something on Facebook to, you know, so friends in other places, because I wanted you to hear it first, and then only later uh, would other, other people learn about it. But one of the first people who responded to this, uh, to my announcement, who wasn't a part of Stonebridge, was this guy I, I really love. He lives, lives in England, and um, he does not characterize himself as a Christian uh, at all. He, he calls himself an, an atheist. He, you know, po- will post stuff on Facebook that, it, you know, sometimes very rightly points out the foibles of Christians and, and churches and so on. Um, I remember he, uh, he, he's a, a really good buddy. Is, I saw Maggie Wells. Maggie, are you here today? I thought I saw you earlier. There you are. It's Stephen, our, our friend Stephen. And he was like the first guy that responded to me when I, when I announced this. And, and um, what he wrote to me was this, your ministry has meant so much to me. Atheist guy in England. And I, I love, he, he sends me Christmas cards each year. And by the way, I can always count on the most beautiful religious-themed uh, Christmas cards from him because he knows me. So, by the way, Stephen, if you're listening, shout out to you. Thanks, you know, for the, uh, the nice, nice card or the ni- nice greetings. Um, but I think the very first, he, he's been here for worship, I think, one time. And the very first time he came here, uh, after the message, he turned to Maggie and he said, um, wow, he sounds like he actually believes this. <laughs> See, the, and, and the reason I, I mention all of this is because um, we have an impact on people's lives that we're totally unaware of. We have no clue, the people that are paying attention to us. See, whether uh, there is any cr- true credibility in our lives, there's a consistency between what we say we believe and the way we actually uh, live our lives. And by the way, I don't want that illustration of, you know, my, uh, of, of my friendship with uh, Stephen to come across as self-serving because I'm sure there are many, many times when I have um, probably acted inconsistently and not um, fully honored Christ in the way that I hope that I, I would. Um, but but let's let's listen to um, Steve Kep now, as he tells a little bit about why this passage means so much to him. I'm a recovering alcoholic. After 12 years of marriage, to have that end as promptly as it did was devastating for me. And I found my days consisting of uh, coming home from work, getting the boys ready for bed, getting their homework done, getting fed, getting them ready for bed, sneaking off to the garage and drinking Jack and reading Job. Heck of a combination. Um, But I drank more and more and more over numerous years until the Lord brought me to this church and the Lord brought me to introduce me to a woman who would later become my wife. And through Alcoholics Anonymous, celebrate recovery and growing closer to the Lord, my life has changed. My life, my life right now is amazing. Most important thing in my life is Christ. Then my wife and my kids. Life is good. No, life is great. This text is important to me because it speaks to me as as a man. It speaks to me as a teacher. It speaks to me as an elder. And it speaks to me as a person of ser- in service. Um, and it, aff- it affirms to me that... Um, I have to hold myself up as a sound Christian to all. It doesn't matter whether they're a Christian or not a Christian, but particularly to those who are not a Christian, because I don't want to give them any opportunity to uh, think 
uh, anything less than the church or anything less than Jesus. Uh, he is our Savior. He saved me. If you're hurting right now, if you're struggling with alcoholism, drug addiction, don't mean to sound too personal, if you're overweight, if you're overspending, if you're doing any hurtful thing, contact the church office. They'll get you in touch with us uh, who are in recovery and uh, we'll be glad to meet with you and to visit with you and see what we can do to try to make your life better. Um, we love Christ and we'd be honored to share our experience, strength, and hope with you. You know, when, um, when Steve came to Stonebridge, um, he found hope here. And he found hope here because he discovered uh, a church family. By God's grace, he found a church family where people cared and where people were, were really doing their best to live godly lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he found a place where he was welcome, right where he was, not judged, for where he'd been, but welcomed. And, and over time, and, it, and we need to know this, it always takes time. Over time, his life was transformed. It's not a, a magical thing. Uh, it takes time. But his life was changed. But I don't, I don't think that would have happened if he had come here and he felt judged he met people who had a critical spirit or who, who were not welcome, welcoming to him. Um, I don't think it would have happened if, if he sensed that, well, that's a church that, that talks Jesus, but they don't act Jesus. And this, this is why the Apostle Paul tells Titus, in everything, everything, Set them an example by doing what's good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. So we, we teach best by example. And I think people learn best by example. That's how your kids, are, by the way, your, your kids, grandkids, um, if they come to know Christ uh, by God's grace and, uh, and become believers, it will be because of what they see, not just what they hear. Uh, this is, is one of the reasons why, uh, why here at Stonebridge we do have ministries like uh, Stonebridge Christian Recovery for people who are struggling with, you know, not just alcohol and drug uh, abuse, but all kinds, you, you know, uh, unhealthy relationships and, and all the rest, unhealthy, um, hurtful habits. Um, it's why we offer Financial Peace University here, because people need to see, that, you know, you can read all the stuff about how important it is to save and, you know, all this kind of stuff, to not overspend, et cetera, et cetera, but um, it, it means so much more when you know, we have a couple in our church who's really struggled in their finances and uh, come out of $100,000 of credit card debt to, to be debt-free, for them to tell their story. That makes all the difference in the world. It's why we do growth groups here. And by the way, it's why, why um, many, if not most, of our growth, growth groups mix age, age groups up. We do have some growth groups that are just like, you know, people that want to be with their own age group or whatever, but I think it's so healthy and so helpful for younger Christians to be together with older Christians so that they can share one another, you know, perspectives with one another. So your younger people can ask their questions and raise their challenges. Older people can share their experience and hear God's truth being spoken into their lives as, as well. It's one of, the, one of the reasons that church is so important and why the New Testament holds such a high view of the church. 
We learn to pray for one another, encourage one another, teach one another, build one another up. Not only does the church teach Christian faith, it at its best demonstrates Christianity. It shows us what being a disciple looks like by offering examples, godly examples in, in other people. This is why I want to say if, if you are a believer, the way you live your life is a demonstration of discipleship to other people. And this is what Paul just keeps hammering away at in Titus. He's telling Titus, teach folks, look, your example makes a difference. This is why Paul knew and why, why Paul wanted Titus to know and by extension wants us to know, and this is so important, that how we live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ will bring either honor or dishonor to Christ and his church. One of the things that, um, that just saddens me is the way people in our culture think of the church today. They're, they're just... Um, both in and in outside of the church. Let me just say that, you know, there are a lot of people, um, mostly Christians, who feel that the church is under attack today. Would you agree with that? Um, in some places, the church is under attack. And I think about um, folks who live uh, particularly in other cu countries and other cultures uh, where the church is being persecuted and churches are being bombed and Christians are are being attacked and in places put to death. But in my judgment, at least in our country, the greatest threat to the church uh, in America isn't new atheist detractors who are, you know, ridiculing uh, our beliefs. It isn't secularism. It isn't um, unfriendly government um, policies or political opposition. This may come as a shock to you, and, and again, this is a personal opinion. This isn't in Scripture. I'm just telling you my read of the lay of the land. In my judgment, the greatest threat to the church today is from within. And you may wonder, why am I saying that? Well, look at the news. It just makes me so sad, and it makes me so angry to read about scandals in the church. Um, just in the past month or so, uh, there have been so many articles and, uh, and so on written about um, the abuse of, that has been, uh, abuse of young children that was allowed uh, to take place and then covered up in the Catholic Church. But I want to say, I'm not going after the Catholic Church here because there are prominent Protestant evangelical megachurch leaders who have also brought dishonor to the name of Jesus Christ and to his church. And that makes me sad and angry. It makes me sad and angry, first of all, for the victims, but it also makes me sad and angry because of the dishonor that it has brought to Jesus Christ and his church and the way it allows people to be dismissive of the gospel. And because they're dismissive, they are not open then to the message of salvation that's freely offered to them. Christians, no matter what their role, see, and it, it would be easy for us to, to be kind of judgmental of these church leaders who, found, who create these situations for us and so on, but I think it's really incumbent upon us. It's important for all of us to know Christians, no matter what our role, we are all called to be Christ-like because we all have our circle of influence. And it may you know, not be on the national news radar, but it's on the radar of our friends and of our families, of our communities, of our workplaces and all the rest. We are called to use whatever measure of God-given wisdom and experience that we have been given to guide and to encourage and to be an example for other people by the way that we live because how we live, how I live, how you live, will either bring honor or dishonor 
to the name of Jesus Christ and to his church. And this is why you know, I say that I think one of the major areas in which the, the modern church has really fallen short of uh, a, a true biblical understanding and biblical practice is in the area of the doctrine of the church. Each of us as members of the body of Christ, we have an indispensable, irreplaceable role to play in being supportive and encouraging of our church family and of living lives of integrity that not only, um, because we, we not only uh, talk about the gospel, we demonstrate whether we believe it or not by the way in which we live. And so Paul concludes in this chapter, for the grace of God has appeared. He's talking about Jesus. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And it teaches us. What does it teach us? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, there's that word again, upright and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what's good. I hope that there's somebody in your life who stands as an example, as a mentor, as a model for what mature Christian faith looks like. And I hope that there are people in your life that you're kind of taking under your wings to help them grow in their faith. I hope that you are seen by others as a mentor and a model and as an example because you are.